Good morning. Good morning, honorary guest, Lorraine, Lorraine of uh, the Dan David Day Prize, dear speakers and audience. We are privileged to have the opportunity of organizing this uh, special symposium on global warming and uh, renewable energy with the laureate uh, of the Dan David Prize for the year 2007, Dr. James Hansen of NASA Goddard Institute for uh, Space Studies in New York, and Dr. Sarah Kuntz, Kurtz and Dr. Jerry Olson of the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. Uh, the Dan David Prize is awarded annually for achievement having an outstanding scientific, technological, cultural, or social impact on our world. Each year, fields are chosen within the three time dimensions, past, present, and future. This year, the future dimension has been devoted to the quest of energy, and this is why we are here. Dr. Hansen was awarded the prize for what the jury described as his exceptional work that changed our perception of, of planet Earth and our understanding of the global forces that control climate changes. Dr. Olson and Dr. Kurtz were honored for their profound research and technological breakthroughs in the field of photovoltaic energy, which have the potential to allevi alleviate the world's impending energy crisis. Today's symposium is part of the Dan David Prize events and is organized jointly by the Porter School of Environmental Studies at Tel Aviv University, the Department of Geophysical and Planetary Sciences, and the Fleischmann Faculty of Engineering. The, the, the symposium consists of two parts. The first deal with the threat of global warming, with a lecture by Dr. Hansen, and future discussions on the Israeli perspective by Professor Alpert of Tel Aviv University. The second part will address a possible remedy to the problem in terms of the of large-scale use of solar le electricity with lectures by Dr. Olsen and by Professor Kribus of the University. I would like to mention that the profound scientific aspect of Kurtz and Olsen's work were presented yesterday by Dr. Kurtz in the special uh, seminar at the Faculty of Engineering, and I would like to express our gratitude for that. Uh, so I would like to start by calling uh, Professor Hudib Nayau, the head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies. Thank you. Our esteemed guests, Dr. Sarah Kurtz, Dr. James Hanson, Dr. Jerry Olson, Professor Woody Ayman, the Dean of Faculty of uh, Engineering at Tel Aviv University, my colleagues and also speakers of today, uh, Professor Halpert and Professor Krivus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies, the PSES, I am delighted to welcome you here today. I would like to say a few words about the special structure of our school, the PSES, that allows us to put on together with the Department of Geophysics and Planetary Sciences, the Faculty of Engineering, and Dan David Prize event such as today's symposium. The PSES is a unique type of school, not only at Tel Aviv University, but also in Israel. We work with all faculties and disciplines at the university across hard and soft sciences, promoting multidisciplinary view of environment. We believe that this approach is vital for providing solutions to today's environmental issues. Our graduate program offering master's and PhD degrees, and I'm very delighted to see young faces among the people sitting here, and this is our students, and I welcome them. This program adopts this approach as the students can undertake their environmental research from whichever disciplines 
they choose, with access to all the university's faculty, departments, and facilities. The topic of today's symposium, Global Warming and Renewable Energy, is one of, if not the most pressing environmental issue facing us today. It is global issue which is relevant to all of us. As the PSES, at the PSES, we aim at tackle environmental problems that are of high priority nationally, regionally, and internationally. It is therefore fitting that much of our work at the PSES deals with the different aspects of global warming, renewable energy, and related topics. The 2007 Dan David Prize honors Dr. James Hansen, Dr. Sarah Kurtz, and Dr. Jerry Olson for their significant contribution in the field of quest for energy. I am delighted that we have been able to bring together and to host today the Dan David 2007 laureates and warmly welcome you. I wish all of us an interesting and fruitful symposium. Thank you very much. Is this uh, turned on? I think it's, it's open. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, it's a, a great pleasure uh, to be in Israel and uh, to speak with you today. And let me uh, find my charts here. So, global warming, uh, connecting the dots. Um, there are uh, a lot of dots to connect. And in the middle of the night, I decided uh, I, I <laughs> that I really need to give a little bit different talk than I usually do to get into half an hour, 35 minutes, with, uh, whether I'm allowed, is um, difficult. And I, I want to make sure that I get to some of the dots that I think are important, and if I start with too much science, I'm afraid I may not get to some of these. So I'm going to reverse it and start with s some things that I usually talk about at the end. And uh, to the extent that I don't get to all of the dots, you can find uh, on my website, which is given there, um, charts and uh, papers that may do a uh, better job of that a more complete job. For example, you now hear a lot, at least in my country, that the United States should not do anything until China uh, agrees to do at least as much. Uh, that's, that's really uh, not an appropriate way to look at the problem if you look at the data. It is true that the current carbon dioxide emissions, and carbon dioxide, uh, as I will explain later, is the principal greenhouse gas that's causing global warming, and all the more so in the future. Carbon dioxide will dominate the problem. And it is true that China is going to pass the United States as the principal emitter of carbon dioxide within the next year or two. They're now almost equal. However, that's not what causes climate change. What causes climate change is the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that has been put there by uh, different countries. 
part, a, a large fraction of the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, stays there for an eternity. About a quarter of it is still there after 500 years. So if you look at the accumulated emissions, that um, the United States has more than three times that of any other country, with China and Russia about equal as a second, but, but with the United States three times larger. And uh, if you look at the per capita emissions, it's, uh, the United States is an order of magnitude more than China or India, the developing countries. And furthermore, there's another uh, important point, and that is that the United States has additional obligation or burden because we, we have blocked the attainment of effective international accord to deal with this uh, climate problem. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was designed analogous to the Montreal Protocol, which was the, the international way of dealing with the ozone problem. And that was a very effective uh, w w way to solve that problem. You know, in 1973, uh, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina reported that chlorofluorocarbons might destroy ozone. And that was uh, reported in the media, and people responded quite rapidly. They stopped using uh, spray cans with chlorofluorocarbons for hairspray and deodorant and such frivolous uses. And so there were no more factories were built. The production of chlorofluorocarbons flattened out in the early 1970s. And then uh, 10 years later, the Arctic, uh, Antarc the ozone hole was discovered over Antarctica. And they realized, oh, this was not just a theoretical problem, it's a real problem. And uh, so the Montreal Protocol was negotiated, and that protocol allowed developing countries an additional 10 years because the thing that this, the use of chlorofluorocarbon started to increase a bit in the late 1970s because China and India were starting to build refrigerators. And uh, it was realized that, well, they had a right to have refrigerators also. So they were given an extra 10 years. There were no restrictions on them for 10 years. But then they had to agree that they would phase out chlorofluorocarbons also, 10 years after the developed world did. And they did it with the assistance of the developed world, uh, te uh, technological assistance and financial assistance in phasing out chlorofluorocarbons. And the problem uh, was solved. So that was really a success story. The scientists gave a warning. The special interests did deny the science for several years, but eventually they came around and developed uh, alternatives to chlorofluorocarbons. And the media did a good job, the public did a, a, a good job, and the United States and Europe exercised leadership in uh, solving the problem. In contrast, in the global warming story, I think that we scientists have not done a very good job of making clear how, how important the problem is and the fact that we will produce a different planet uh, if we continue uh, with emissions on business as usual. And the special interests have been a particularly effective in influencing the public discussion, uh, influencing the media. The media depends upon uh, money from special interests and advertising, and uh, the government in particular is influenced by uh, special interests. And uh, it has left a discussion of the problem which has been uh, unnecessarily confused by the special interests. Uh, and as a result, the CO2 emissions have continued to increase at a business as usual rate. And there's another uh, aspect of this story which I describe in uh, an article that I wrote in World Watch uh, magazine. Uh, the the government is not interested in uh, in uh, information um, if it uh, conflicts with um, 
some uh, intended policies. And in fact, when they um, are, are told about this, they have, the response has been to decrease the research funding in, in the problem area rather than investigate the problem. And, and in my agency, in fact, um, it used to be that our first line in our mission statement was to understand and protect the home planet. Well, that line was removed from our mission statement, and the research funding for Earth science was reduced 30 percent. Um, and uh, so one of the dots that I like to uh, mention at the beginning, uh, this was one of the recommendations that I made in discussing uh, global warming at uh, the congressional testimony. I, I have, uh, I, I think a important point, at, at least in uh, my country, is that the degree to which politics has taken over the um, the transfer of information to the public, the this, the discussion, the public discussion. So, for example, all of the science agencies are now staffed. the The public affairs office in all of the science agencies are staffed by political appointees who feel that their job is to uh, support the administration rather than to give, that, then communicate scientific findings of the agencies to the public. And um, when a government scientist testifies to Congress, that testimony must be approved by the White House. And I don't know where that requirement comes from. If you look in our Constitution, I cannot find anything that uh, resembles that. It is, a, it is an example of what I discuss in the article um, that I, I showed the title page. Um, it's an example of the tendency toward a unitary executive uh, form of government, which I feel was not intended by the framers of our Constitution. Uh, and uh, so, as it turns out, although I'm going to talk mainly about the science of global warming, I think that the solutions, and I'm supposed to be connecting the dots from the science problem to the uh, solutions, they're going to be very difficult to achieve as long as special interests have special place in the functioning of our government. And that is going to be difficult to, uh, to solve that problem unless we have true effective campaign finance reform so that officials in our government do not depend upon contributions from uh, from businesses and other sources. Um, okay, now, so those are some of the dots. Oh, well, let me say one more thing. <laughs> who, uh, who bears the responsibility for the situation we're in that I'm going to describe in a minute? Um, the, I think that, as I mentioned, that scientists, the media, the special interests, <laughs> the politicians and the public all bear responsibility. I mean, we, you know, we do uh, live in democracies and we are electing the people who are in office. So, for example, in the United States now for the last, it's been going on for years now, cases in which some states are trying to reduce, trying to place requirements on man automobile manufacturers to produce more efficient vehicles that produce less uh, CO2 and uh, other pollutants. But they are opposed in court not only by the automobile manufacturers but by the friend of the court, the government. 
and that government is our government. And it's we're, I'm saying our, I mean United States government, <coughs> which we elect. You know, it's our, it's our uh, so we can't, we can't blame it on the government because we're in, in a democracy, you, you elect uh, the officials. Unfortunately, um, who will pay is none of the first five. It's, it's going to be the young people. Also, it's going to be the developing countries because, as you will see, they, they tend to uh, be both more vulnerable and, as chance has it, the climate effects uh, tend to be larger in the developing world. And, of course, the other uh, species on the planet don't have anything to do with the problem, but they're going to uh, be affected by it. Now, there are a couple of um, scientific points that I want to make. One is that if we imagine that we put into the atmosphere a pulse of carbon dioxide from by burning fossil fuel, by burning coal or other fossil fuel, that uh, carbon dioxide is partially taken up by, especially by the ocean, but also by the soils and, and the biosphere. And, and relatively quickly, this is the remaining fraction of the pulse. And so after 30 years, already half of it has been taken up. Uh, but at, after 100 years, a third of it is still there. And after 500 years, about, about a quarter of it is still there because, because most of it is taken up by the ocean. And the CO2 that goes into the ocean then can, can bubble back out. It exerts a back pressure on the atmosphere. And until there are chemical reactions that take it out of the ocean and deposit it as sediments at the bottom of the ocean, it's going to continue to put um, CO2 back into the atmosphere. So it takes, um, you know, it, it takes many centuries. It takes uh, thousands of years for these uh, for the CO2 to go back uh, in, into into the earth. Uh, and that's so. That's one important constraint on this problem. And another one, <laughs> which I. I couldn't find a graph uh, in the middle of the night, uh, so I gave up after a while, but I'll tell you what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> if, imagine, imagine that the sun suddenly became 2% brighter. That the Earth absorbs about 240 watts per meter squared of energy from the sun. So if the sun became 2% brighter, that would be what we call a forcing of, you know, of uh, between four and five watts per meter squared. And obviously, if the sun becomes brighter, the Earth is going to become warmer. But how fast does it become warmer? That's the graph I wanted to show you. Uh, <coughs> the point is that the it takes a while because you have to warm up the ocean. The ocean is four kilometers deep. The response time does depend upon climate sensitivity and feedbacks, <coughs> but for the typical, the climate sensitivity that we now understand is, and I'll explain uh, to some extent how we know, but with uh, the typical climate sensitivity, it takes about 25 years before, so the, the, the Earth's temperature before the sun became brighter will vary just because of chaos in the climate system. But then you increase the brightness of the sun, and it will warm up and eventually get to a new temperature. Well, it takes about 25 or 30 years, we estimate, to get half of that warming. But then the ocean, the surface of the ocean that is partially warmed up mixes with the deeper ocean so that after 100 years, you still only have 65 or 70 percent of the equilibrium warming. And after 500 years, you've got about 95 percent. So the point is there's a lag of several decades in the response of the climate system to a forcing. And that's how this problem differs from the typical, that's one, th those two uh, reasons, the fact that the pollutant stays in the atmosphere for centuries and the fact that the system does not respond to the pollutant immediately, 
makes this problem more difficult, and it's the one which has made communication with the public and communication with policymakers particularly difficult, because people like to wait and see. They like to see the uh, problem before they're going to deal with it. And um, in the case of air pollution, particulate air pollution, that which affects human health, people, you know, they waited until uh, eventually in the 1950s the um, pollution in London became so bad that with uh, smog that uh, a thousand people died in a short time. And, and then they realized uh, we really had better stop uh, burning coal in household uh, uh, furnaces and stoves, and uh, so they, they passed regulations that stopped that. And when you stop it, within five days the pollution's gone because the life, because uh, particles fall out of the atmosphere that quickly. Well, that's not the case with CO2. It's going to hang around for centuries. And the other difference is you could see the effect then, but now we can't, we've only seen part of the effect. There's a there's warm, additional global warming that's in the pipeline due to this long response time of the system. So, so far the Earth has warmed up about eight-tenths of a degree Celsius. And it's just enough that you're almost able to see it. Public can notice that there's beginning to be some change. But it's small in comparison to weather variations because the weather depends more upon what direction the wind is blowing from. If it's blowing from the north instead of the south, it'll be 10 degrees difference in temperature. So it's a little hard to notice uh, eight-tenths of a degree change, but there's more that's in the pipeline. And so the problem is there is uh, uh, there's a gap between what is understood by scientists about this problem and what is known by the people who need to know, and that's the public and policymakers. The truth is we are at a point of having a crisis, and it's not obvious to people. Um, we are near tipping points of the climate system. <coughs> Two in particular, the sea ice in the Arctic has begun to uh, decrease in the in the warm season, the summer and fall. There's been a reduction of about 25 percent in the amount of sea ice in the Arctic, and th there's a very strong positive feedback because as you le lose the sea ice, then the ocean absorbs more sunlight, and that's a positive feedback, and it melts more ice. And so we don't need much more forcing to lose all of the sea ice, and that's a, a problem uh, for uh, wildlife that lives in that area or the in indigenous people. There's an, another problem that is, and it also would, would, be, would bode ill for the health of the Greenland ice sheet on the long run. But there's another problem which I think is even more important and also <laughs> we're near a tipping point, and that is the Antarctic ice sheet which, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is um, an ice sheet that sits on bedrock uh, below sea level. So this ice sheet is subject to being attacked by global warming both from below and from above. Um, and it's already has begun to lose mass in the last few years at a rate of about 150 cubic kilometers per year. and. I think, uh, and again, there are positive feedbacks. If, as it gets warmer and has more melting in the summer, then it absorbs more sunlight, and as you, it begins to disintegrate and, and the, the surface sinks to lower altitude, then it's warmer because the temperature de decreases with height. Um, so that's, there's, and if we were to lose the West Antarctic ice sheet, that means a sea level rise of about seven meters or 25 feet, so it's uh, it's a uh, it's a big deal. Um, now, I uh, I'm supposed to end when? Pardon? Okay, so about 10 minutes. Okay, so um, we live in 
the Holocene. This is the temperature, it's actually the temperature in Antarctica because it's, we can measure it there quite well by taking an ice core which has a record of the temperature at which the snow formed at the time the, the ice sheet builds up from snow fall year after year. So we have a record of more than 400,000 years of the temperature. But the temperature at other places on the Earth has a very similar shape. Um, in the Antarctic, the temperature between the warm periods, the interglacials, and the ice ages uh, varies by about 10 degrees Celsius. At the equator, the variations are smaller. They're only 3 to 4 degrees, and on the global average, it's about 5 degrees. But we've been in this nice warm period for almost 12,000 years. It's called the Holocene, and that's the period that civilization developed in. Um, and it's been actually part of the reason that civilization was able to develop is the sea level was stable during that period. If we go back to the last ice age, sea level was 120 meters uh, lower than it is now, and in the transition from the ice age to the interglacial, sea level was going up one to two meters a century on the average, um, and um, in some cases for as much as four to five meters per century. Well, uh, this uh, period of... Uh, so, in the Holocene, the planet was warm enough to keep ice sheet off of Canada and uh, northern Europe, but it's cool enough to keep ice sheets stable on Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, we're about to leave that nice uh, intermediate stage. It, this is a graph of the quantity, don't have time to explain it, but oxygen-18 in ocean sediments tells us it's a measure of uh, both the amount of ice on the land and the temperature. And uh, as you go from three and a half million years ago to the present, the, the climate fluctuates uh, from ice age to interglacial period. Uh, for reasons that we understand, and it, the planet has gradually been getting colder over that period. The, um, uh, the reason for the flux these regular fluctuations from ice age to interglacial are due to changes in the, the Earth's orbit. In particular, the most important characteristic of the orbit is the tilt of the Earth's axis relative to the, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Uh, it because Jupiter and Saturn tug on the Earth, the uh, spin axis wobbles by plus or minus one degree. And when it's more tilted so that the North Pole is exposed and then six months later the South Pole is exposed to more sunlight, we tend to melt the uh, ice in the, uh, with the larger tilt. And so we see, and that, that axis varies with the 41,000 year periodicity. And so we see the climate changing with the 41,000 year uh, periodicity. Um, but that, that forcing is a very weak forcing. Uh, how, but it, um, the way it, the climate works, what happens is that there are positive feedbacks that amplify that very weak forcing. One of the feedbacks is simply the reduction in the area of the ice, and because it leaves a darker surface underneath where the ice was, it absorbs more sunlight, and that, that's a positive uh, feedback that amplifies the warming as you melt the ice. And also, these greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, you see they change along with the temperature. as the planet becomes warmer, the ocean, for example, gives out more CO2. And that is, a, since these gases trap heat radiation, infrared radiation, this amplifies the, um, uh, the, and those two mechanisms, the change in the surface albedo and the change in the atmospheric greenhouse gases, account for very accurately the temperature changes that occur. So the, 
you can see that the this is a graph of the greenhouse gases the green line and the temperature in the red line and you can see that they're very consistent but the temperature is slightly lagging the greenhouse uh, sorry the um, greenhouse gases are slightly lagging the temperature on in this natural case where the driving factor is changes in the Earth's orbit. Well, of course, now it's a different situation. Here I've graphed the, the um, greenhouse gases as a function of time the last 400,000 years, uh, these data coming from Antarctic ice cores where bubbles of air have been trapped. Uh, so we have a record for the last 400,000 years. And temperature. Uh, but now what's happened is humans, by burning fossil fuels, have put enormous amounts of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere so that the amounts are completely outside the range of, uh, of the natural range. And the climate is... Uh, is going to respond to these greenhouse gases just as it did in the past. It takes time because of the uh, thermal inertia, but um, the, um, the conclusions from this paleoclimate case are uh, humans, bottom line is that humans are now in control of global climate. So we're not going to have any more natural cycles. The Earth will never go to an ice age again because to prevent an ice age, we only need a thimbleful of chlorofluorocarbon, so there's no reason that humans would allow the planet to go to an ice age. Problem is the contrary, that we're going to become warmer and we need to limit the amount of that warming. Uh, the warming is now about eight-tenths of a degree Celsius in the last hundred years, with three-quarters of that warming in the last 30 years, while the when, in the last few decades, the greenhouse gases have been increasing uh, most rapidly. We try to project into the future. We can, we can simulate what has happened in the last century quite accurately. And if we use the models to then uh, simulate the future, if we continue on business as usual, uh, the... Uh, see, I have a pointer here. If we continue along business as usual, we will get global warming. Uh, of two or three degrees Celsius before the end of this century. I contrast that with an alternative scenario in which we begin to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and by the middle of the century have reduced them by a few tens of percent and by the end of the century have stabilized atmospheric composition. In that case, we can keep global warming less, additional global warming less than one degree. Um, and it has been agreed by all countries in the world that we should try to stabilize atmospheric composition at a level that prevents dangerous human-made interference with the climate system. The problem is that nobody has defined what dangerous level is. Um, I think the criteria for that, principal criteria, should be ice sheet disintegration because... Uh, for one thing, because the effect of losing Greenland or West Antarctica would be sea level rise of several meters. If we, if we look at the Earth's history, <clears throat> the last time that the Earth was two to three degrees Celsius warmer was in the middle Pliocene three million years ago, and at that time sea level was 25 meters higher. Now, it takes time for the ice sheets to respond to a warmer climate, but that's where you would, we would be headed if we go down business as usual. Uh, <clears throat> and that there are a billion people who live within 25 meters elevation of sea level. So it's something which is just um, unthinkable, and we really can't go down that path. And likewise, the extermination of species is irreversible once they're extinct, they're extinct. And um, we know, again, if we look at the history of the Earth, there have been several large warming events of several degrees, and when they occurred, of the order of 90% of the species on the planet went extinct. 
Well, of course, other species developed over hundreds of thousands and millions of years, but if we drive species extinct now, you know, the time scale for recovering a new species, whatever they will be, is not in any time scale that humans can think about. It would be uh, so many, no generation that you can possibly imagine would be around. So it's not something we want to do. And there are also large regional effects. Um, and we are, uh, uh, well, I'm going to have to uh, summarize, but the changes on the ice sheets are beginning to happen. Summer melt is increasing, and the discharge of giant icebergs to the ocean has doubled from Greenland. And, uh, and we know for sure that the mass of both Greenland and West Antarctica are decreasing now at rates of about 150 uh, cubic kilometers per year. So, and if we, uh, you know, if we did have 25 meter sea level rise, there would be uh, more than 250 million people in China and the entire nation of Bangladesh would be underwater. So we really can't um, go in that direction. Um, species, um, also, we, there are many examples I could give. I'll just mention one of them. Uh, there are in the American Southwest. There are islands in the sky. Uh, the um, forests on the mountains, where um, there are different types of wildlife. Well, we're now pushing by warming up the planet. <coughs> we're pushing off the planet those species that live in alpine regions. And this is a particular species which is now uh, threatened. And the uh, uh, and at the poles, we are pushing off the planet. We will be pushing off the planet those species that have no place colder to migrate to. Um, this, so far, the stresses on species at most places on the planet have more to do with other things that humans have been doing. But as this, but now, the a given temperature line is moving poleward at a rate of about 60 kilometers per decade. And as that movement in a single direction continues, it's going to, uh, it's going to uh, cause problems for many more species. I think, I think that I'm going to uh, have to summarize very quickly. We could, we could I, I'm still optimistic that if we started to address this problem within the next few years that, <coughs> that we could solve it uh, because uh, if we look at the fossil fuels, oil and gas are enough to take us up to about 450 parts per million, and that's about enough to cause one degree more warming. So if we want to keep additional warming less than one degree, and based on the Earth's history, I would argue that we, that's the level, that's the most war additional warming we should allow. We could, we could uh, probably achieve that if we would agree not to use coal and the unconventional fossil fuels, that means tar shale and tar sands, uh, except where we capture the CO2 and sequester it. So the coal, we should not be building any more old-fashioned coal plants. We should wait until we have the technology to capture the CO2 and sequester it. And uh, if we did that, and if we stretched conventional oil and gas by means of both incentives, that means of pricing, and um, by, by standards, then um, we wouldn't need to begin to develop tar, tar shale and such things because we're going to eventually have to move to different technologies anyway. Uh, and we just need to do that uh, more quickly and stretch the existing uh, fossil fuels. And there, there are other uh, forcings that we could reduce that allow a little bit more CO2 to exist then. And we can draw down atmospheric CO2 both by improved agricultural and forestry practices and by burning biofuels in power plants, capturing the CO2 then and sequestering it. So in effect then the plants draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere, we capture it at the power plants and sequester it. So we're putting the CO2 back where it came from, in the ground. And so it is possible to solve this problem, but only if we begin to address it. And the problem has been that uh, that we've been 
denying the problem and arguing about it rather than beginning to address it and if we go even another ten years without on business as usual that would put our emissions in 2015 35 percent higher than they were in year 2000 and then it becomes really impractical to keep global warming less than one degree so I think we need to get moving on this promptly thanks thank you dr. Hansen the issue of global warming from the Israeli perspective will be addressed by professor Pinchas Alpert of Tel Aviv University please The way I want to address the issue is a little different than what my colleagues and students here are expecting after thinking also through the middle of the night and I decided to go the opposite way and look into the history from a personal perspective on what was done in Israel regarding the global warming issue. I happened to stay with Professor Linsen for two years in my postdoc studies. This I called the skepticism period in which it was very clear to me Linsen is one of the big skeptics of global warming. I think he appeared together with Jim Hansen in the congressional testimonies starting maybe over 20 years ago. And uh, the first, when I returned to Israel, to Tel Aviv University in 1982, the first thing that caused me, at least, to start thinking again about the problem was something very little. I called it a mesoclimatic, mesoscale climatic change over South Israel. Uh, we published it in 1986. It refers to a small area over the Negev in which we clearly uh, showed that there are changes in the climate. And the rainfall also studies that later, together with a student, Ben Guy, changes in precipitation in Israel. And I was trying to recollect what happened to myself during these years, because global warming was already an issue. And then Linsen published his very well-known paper, uh, which is called Some Coolness about Global Warming in 1990. And he was asked in 1991 in a congressional testimony about it by Al Gore. By the way, there is a very interesting book, The Heat Is On, that was published a little later, that uh, brings the discussions in the congressional testimonies between Al Gore and Linsen. I think also your discussions there. The first climate conference in Israel which addressed the issue that there might be problems to Israel climate was in 1992 at the, the, the Weizmann Institute. And there it was the place where I presented the first numerical simulations over Israel. These simulations I want to show you they were published in Climatic Change in 1994. Segal came to me and he said, you know, we need to look. Israel may be vulnerable to the global warming. 
What happens if the 60 kilometers to the north within a decade, what happens if the Negev moves into Tel Aviv? So we did some experiments. I want to show you this really first, first experiments, and then I come back to uh, In this paper, we took several case studies. The computer time that was available at that time was very little particular in Israel, but we have addressed several Cyprus law cases which provide the rainfall to our area. And we changed some parameters, the sea surface temperature and the tropopause stability and then we found two major findings. One is the increased aridity looking into precipitation minus evaporation. Precipitation goes down, but more important, evaporation goes up. So P minus E goes down. And also, another point, snow is going to disappear. It is very it's a funny that this is a point that worries many people here. They cannot wait 100 years or 50 years to see some huge things to occur. But when I told people, you know, Jerusalem is not going to have snow, this really worries them a lot. And the Hermon. Now, these were the findings in these studies. And these are some of the results of three case studies of a Cyprus law in which we shown in this paper going from Alexandria to Adana from south to north the reduction when we modify the simulations to include the effects of global warming. This is one example of the runs on the right side On the right side, you have the results from this specific run for a doubling of CO2 in which the desert line moves farther to the north compared to the line over Beersheba. Now, this was very, very simple method applied about 20 years ago to global warming. Let me skip now 20 years a little less than 20 years to what we are doing now. Now we are running regional climate models. We have to run 30 years, a climatic period for 1961 to 1992, which is a control period, and 2071 to 2100, and then compare for different scenarios. This is the worst scenario, A2. We see reductions of 50 to 100 millimeters per year compared to a different scenario, which is a little better, the B2 scenario. Now, the situation today is that we are able for the first time, as shown yesterday in the seminar by Simon Critcher, that we are now able to look into uncertainties relating to regional climate modeling in this area. There are a number of uncertainties which I will not go into, it, just putting them. And these studies have been done in Europe, in Denmark, in Germany, I guess 15 years ago. They are done only now in Israel, in order to understand what, we, what will happen in global warming. I want to return to one of the points in which I visited NASA for sabbatical in 1995, and then I met, I met the late Yoram Kaufman, which is about a year. I want to dedicate this talk to him, about a year to his uh, Die, that he died from an air bike accident on the 31st of May, 2006. So we worked together. And he told me, Yoram, two things. One, 
that this slide was for him the most convincing because it's about the same thing that Jim Hansen showed before. Within 400,000 years, the global climate, this is CO2, and this is the temperature, they're oscillating within a limited range. And now we are located somewhere here, 380. But the other thing he told me about Jim Hansen, he was very much impressed by the way you were able to predict the peanut tubo reduction in the temperatures. And we discussed it many times. And this is what convinced him that indeed climate models have the power to show what is really going to happen. These two points. Now, I want to bring another point in which, of my personal perspective, when I was representing Israel in this IPCC, which is an intergovernmental panel on climate change in Shanghai, which was a summary in January 2001 of the earlier report. And I want to bring you a short, very short story in which I understood the power of the politics. I must admit that in contrast to Jim Ansem, I was acting very, very slowly. And maybe it's the legacy of, uh, of, uh, legacy of Linsen with the skepticism, but it also has to do with a lot of Jewish skepticism, I think. But this is something which brought to my mind how, what is the power given to the oil companies. I was sitting there in Shanghai in this meeting, and we were discussing this sentence for the policymakers. The global average surface air temperature has increased by 0.6 degrees since 1860. And this value is about 0.15 degrees larger than the estimated by the second assessment report. Dr. El Saban, the representative of the government of Saudi Arabia with a very large delegation. They have four or five people. I was the only one from Israel. He suggested to insert something in this sentence. And after estimated to put the words more subjectively. And this took from the three days discussions about two hours because the objections were made even by the United States the United States representative, by the way. He was also objecting to this. But uh, then I understood really what is in stake here. One example. Now, fortunately, in Israel, we were lucky to have in 2000, uh, starting 2001, this uh, relatively first large project which is called Global Jordan River, financed by the BMBF, the German Ministry of Science, which looks into the water sources over the Eastern Mediterranean environments. And this is the, really the first investment in understanding what is, the, what is going to be the impact of global warming in Israel on water sources, on biodiversity, on uh, forests, etc about a million dollars per year since then, with many, many groups. I am very glad that this started. And these are the two main objectives of this project. But I am happy to inform you that the government of Israel is now have made a very important decision. On the 11th of March, 2007, there was a meeting as proposed by Yeshayahu Baror, the chief scientist of the Ministry of Environment, but put forward by the Ministry of the Prime Minister. And we had representatives from all the ministries, really, not, maybe not all, but most of the important ministries in Israel. And a decision was made 
to establish national committees in, this, in these subjects. Energy, water, coastal processes, agriculture, health, environment, biodiversity, and climate. And the mandate given to these committees is to study what within, we are going to have another meeting in June to see what are the potential impacts in Israel and what is really necessary to study in the near future very soon about these impacts. Now I get to my lecture. And the lecture is about regional uh, climate trends to extremes and regional modeling over the Eastern Mediterranean. And I realized that I will be finished at about this time. So thank you. Moving on to the second half of this uh, interesting symposium, which deals with a possible, which deals with a possible uh, remedy to the solution to the problem which has been uh, introduced. So uh, uh, the second half is devoted to solar energy solutions, and I'm honored to invite Dr. Jerry Olson. And the title of his lecture is uh, "From Megawatts to Terawatts." The promise of high efficiency multi junction solar cells. use Macintosh computers and so the keyboard is a little bit strange to me. Well, um, I'd first of all like to uh, thank the Porter School of Environment, Environmental Sciences um, and the Dan David Foundation for giving me the opportunity and really the distinct honor of, of uh, being able to speak here today. Um, uh, what we do at NREL what we've done over NREL in the last 20 years has really received um, recognition only in the last few years uh, in, in, in a major sort of way. And one very large part of that recognition has been from the Dan David Foundation and for which we are truly grateful. Um, today I'm going to talk about this thing called a multi-junction, uh, high efficiency multi-junction solar cells. This is a schematic of the device. This is a schematic of the device. Um, won't mean much to you right now. Um, solar cells are often called solar batteries because they typically have a, a negative terminal and a positive terminal. But as opposed to a regular battery, they only give off current. They only deliver current to a load when you shine light on them. If you don't shine light on them, there's no current. Um, now these cells, have, these types of cells, have been around for a long time. They began, oh, probably they, the first solar cells were invented back in the mid 80, uh, mid 1800s. Um, the first real practical uses came in the mid 50s. Bell Labs and uh, some of the electronics companies started using them to power remote telephone stations. Um, and actually, it was one of the first uh, the solar satellites going into space were first powered by uh, silicon solar cells. But this particular solar cell is, is quite unique in that it's essentially two to four times more efficient than any other solar cell on the market today. So typical solar cells are 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 20%, I should say. This solar cell can be anywhere from 35, 40%, and I'll get to that in a moment. This is the device uh, for which uh, we received the Dan David Prize. Uh, 
It was invented in uh, Enrel in about the mid 80s. And uh, probably the more important, uh, related to, well, related to the fact that it's the most efficient solar cell on the market, is the fact that it has spawned a renewed interest in a solar cell technology, namely concentrating PV, which up to about four years ago was, I would say, basically on the brink of extinction. Um, currently, this solar cell has a very valuable uh, use in outer space. In particular, almost 80% of the satellites that are now launched into space are powered by this satellite. In addition, uh, there's a couple of rovers up on the surface of Mars called Spirit and Opportunity, which um, have been in, whose lives have been extended by, in part, having really good solar cells to power those, uh, those rovers. Well, you, in that talk, you may have uh, stumbled over the, the first line of the tile, uh, title. Um, well, what's a terawatt? And it's hard uh, for a lot of people to get their, to get their uh, mind around the magnitude of this, of this number. But maybe I can give you some idea. Uh, a megawatt is basically a million watts. You know, a light bulb takes about 60 watts. One megawatt will power a few hundred homes. A terawatt is a million times bigger. Okay, and we use the quantity t that we use the units terawatts because to run the world, you need something on the on the order of 15 terawatts of electricity. That's in today's, that's in today's uh, situation. Uh, in 1990, it was only nine terawatts. In other words, the growth of the world's energy needs is growing at a rate of about two, per three, two or three per percent per year. And it's this growth in the generation of electricity, mainly by fossil fuels, which is contributing almost exclusively to <coughs> The greenhouse effects, okay, that uh, Dr. Hansen and the other speaker talked about earlier this morning. Now, from an energy standpoint, what's going to happen over the next 20 years, say, because of a world, because of a world uh, population that's growing, we're probably going to need something on the order of 10 terawatts of carbon-free power. Or now, this isn't necessarily renewable power; it could be conventional power where we do carbon uh, sequestration. Probably some of this uh, 10 terawatts will, will be averted by just good conservation techniques. But for the sake of argument, let's just say that we need 20% of that 10 terawatts to be generated by renewables. That's a big number. It's a really big number. And um, the people in the solar cell industry right now Typical company makes 50 megawatts, maybe 100 megawatts. It's going to take a lot of, of those companies to get to 10, uh, 2 terawatts uh, 20 years from now. But to some extent, it's possible. The major market out there right now is a technology called flat plate crystal and silicon solar cells. This is an image of a large array of those solar cells. Um, by flat plate, what we mean is, is that the the aperture collected by the sun is completely covered with thin, but not thin enough, crystalline silicon solar cells, or maybe even poly polycrystalline silicon solar cells. Now, two terawatts, oh, and by the way, in order to get to that two terawatts, say, over the next 20 years, uh, we're going to, going to need a sustained growth rate of about 35% a year. Now, that's what the current growth rate is in the, semi in the uh, photovoltaics business. And there are many people who think that that number can be sustained, uh, uh, if not even increased, over the next 20 years. But one of the biggest problems with trying to generate such large amounts of power with flat plate crystalline silicon or flat plate copper named diselenide, basically any of the flat plate technologies, is that you have to cover a huge area um, with a very expensive, high-cost, uh, high-purity, high-tech material. Uh, two terawatts 
of material running at, at about 12% efficiency would cover about 17,000 square kilometers. Now that would probably fit nicely in the Negev Desert, okay? Which isn't a big problem. That's if you want to cover all of the Negev Desert with solar cells. But um, the real problem here is the fact that in order to do that, we're going to have to come up with something on the order of 100 billion kilograms of a highly refined, very expensive material called semiconductor silicon. The growth rate that we're currently ex uh, ex uh, experiencing in, in the photovoltaics business, 35% per year, is already creating, whoops, how do I go back? Is, all, whoops, is already creating uh, shortages of, of this material. Uh, it's uh, driving up the cost of the solar cells, that's good for business, <laughs> but there's some companies that may go out of business because they can't get high purity silicon. So what's the solution to this? Well, it says here, concentrator PV to the rescue. Concentrators have the endearing quality, all, all concentrators have the endearing quality. Uh, that light that falls on a, on a mirror, a curved mirror or a lens, or even uh, distributed sections of, of lenses tend to focus that sunlight down to a smaller area uh, that's smaller on the order of 500 to 1,000 times. Okay? So in other words, this is where you'd put your solar cell. Okay? And all of the light falling on the lens gets focused to that, to that solar cell. And if, if this lens is a square meter, all right, the solar cell that you put here is about that big. Okay. So you see how you can save a tremendous amount of material, a material that's very valuable uh, compared to the materials that go into making a concentrator. In addition, the efficiency of that solar cell when you shine, say, 100 or 500 or 1,000 times um, sun, that sun's on it, the efficiency increases, so you need less aperture area and in addition to that, decreases the cost tremendously. And in fact, there are studies out there by, for example, Swanson and Progress in Photovoltaics, 2002, that suggest that these concentrating PV technologies have the lowest cost of any of the solar technologies. Now actually, that's not the case now. Um, these systems that are produced by Solar Systems Limited in Australia are fairly expensive. They're coming down in price, um, but I'll get to the I'll, I'll get to them to, in in a moment. I'll get to why they're probably fairly expensive. But they show you that here's a large mirror uh, that collects about 100 kilowatts of solar power. It focuses that solar power down onto a small area of gallium indium phosphide gallium arsenide solar cells, and generates from that um, small area. 30 kilowatts of power. If you were to put this array just in full sun without uh, the lens array, this number would, would be somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 15, watt, um, yeah, 15 to 30 watts, not very much. So you, this is a very graphic illustration of what uh, concentrating um, photovoltaics can do for you. Well, as I mentioned before, the PV industry is, has an awful lot of promise, but there are several problems. So it's an industry that's basically in its infancy. Last year, only three kilowatts of, uh, excuse me, three megawatts of concentrating PV were sold worldwide. Part of that's due to the fact that concentrators have to be deployed in rather sunny climates. You know, if the sun goes in front, if a cloud goes in front of the sun, the power output from a concentrator essentially goes to zero, whereas a flat plate solar cell might still put out 20, 10, 15, 20 percent of its, of its uh, nominal peak power. Uh, related to that fact is, is the, the requirement that the concentrator must always be pointed at the sun. It must track it, otherwise the, the focal spot moves off the cell and again produces no power. So they're considered to be more complicated. There's, there's um, moving parts and 
a lot of people in the solar industry are really adverse to those two words, moving parts, is as if if we put any moving parts in anything, it's automatically going to degrade. And, and I'll get to that in a moment, too. Um, but other things that are eliminating the cost of these uh, systems right now are, as I mentioned before, uh, the markets are fairly small. The techniques for building these uh, systems are, are in the dark ages still. I mean, this is an Aminex, a 25 kilowatt Aminex system that's built in Southern California. And they're basically built by hand on a factory, uh, factory floor. The other thing limiting the cost of these uh, systems now actually um, are the efficiency and cost of the solar cells that are used in them. Now, for this whole array, you only need a little, uh, a little bit of silicon in the area, which is equal to, say, one of these little modules up here. But because you're focusing so much light on those solar cells, they have to be somewhat special compared to flat plate solar cells. And hence, the silicon solar cells used in these arrays cost more than flat plate silicon. Um, in addition, silicon is a very mature uh, technology. And um, with a lot of really good work, they've pushed the efficiency of silicon solar cells up near the theoretical limit. So. For the most part, there's very little room for silicon to make further contributions to reducing the cost of these concentrated feeding systems. What I show here is the cost of energy production in cents per kilowatt hour. So this is 10 cents per kilowatt hour as a function of the cost of the solar cell in dollars that would go into um, or would sit behind a lens where that lens is concentra concentrating the light down to about a th uh, down to a, a spot uh, where the intensity is a thousand times uh, 500 times higher than the normal sunlight intensity. So you can see that for any one of these curves, it's, you, as you drive the cell cost down, the cost of electricity goes down. But more importantly, as you drive the efficiency of that solar cell up from 25, 30. 45, 50, uh, uh, um, 35, 40, 50, you can see an even greater increase in the efficiency of the device at, say, fixed um, cost. Well, as I mentioned before, silicon, which is the m material that's used in most of the concentrating PV systems right now, is kind of stuck in this range right here. It's a very good candidate, and there's actually a fairly high probability that in the long run, most of the systems you see out there will be silicon at least for the near future. But this new galluminium phosphide technology, even, it's in, if, even in its infancy, infancy, is still able to compete favorably with silicon. And the big, but the big um, uh, reason that people are so interested in, is, in this is the fact that this technology has a large range over which it can improve, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of efficiency. And so you now see that, that we've decreased the cost of electricity by almost a factor of two by going to these high-tech, high-efficiency, multi-junction solar cells. <coughs> well, what do these things look like? Um, these top two junctions, what, are the, the, uh, what do these new solar cells look like that, that are going to drive the cost uh, uh, down so much? Well, basically all of them are based upon the galluminium phosphide, gallium arsenide solar cell that I talked, uh, that I showed you earlier in the talk. Almost all of these solar cells are grown on germanium substrates right now, and germanium is, is another semiconductor material that you can put a junction in and, and you can get um, photovoltaics, at, uh, you can get electricity out. The, the triple combination of these three solar cells in optical series and electrical series has an ide ideal theoretical efficiency of almost 50%. Uh, in the laboratory, or in, or in this case, on the production floor, these numbers are approaching 41%. Um, a company in the United States, Spectralab, which has been one of the pioneers in, in manufacturing these uh, solar cells, has uh, been working on this particular one where they lower the band gap of the middle cell without changing the upper or the lower one. That has a slightly higher theoretical efficiency of about 52%, and in the lab, 
on their production floor, they're getting about 41%. This is a device that we've been working on at NREL. Um, I won't go into it too much. It has even greater potential, at least theoretically. We've only been working on it for a couple of years now, and its efficiency is, is uh, up close to 40% also. But it has more potential for getting well above, 50, uh, up closer to 50% than these other two. You know, just for those of you who, who uh, have never seen one of these solar cells uh, up close, that device that I was just talking about right here is shown in more detail. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that these are really very complicated structures. Uh, they have upwards of uh, 30, 40 layers in the cell. They're grown by a technique called metal organic vapor deposition. Uh, 20 years ago when we proposed this structure, uh, my boss and his boss and some of the people that they listened to were saying that this structure would never be grown. It would be absolutely impossible to control uh, the growth on the scale required in order to get high efficiencies here. Um, and as you can see, they do exist. So, where do we go from here? As I mentioned before, Last year, the concentrating PV industry produced about three megawatts of power. Now, at a growth rate of 35% per year, I mean, with a starting point of three megawatts, it's going to take a long time to get to three terawatts. Okay? So in the, when it comes to concentrating PV, we have to have much higher growth rates in the beginning to get the base level of production up to a, uh, a level on the order of gigawatts per year before this ever can take off uh, and make a contribution to the problem. And developments like this give all of us a, a sense that this, that this is possible. Um, what I show here, I, I showed you this uh, dish system by Solar Systems uh, Limited in Australia. They just recently got a $2.5 billion contract to produce a 1,000 one, 1, megawatt system for this uh, partnership, Asia-Pacific Asia part, part, Partnership on Clean Energy Development and Climate, using the gallium phosphide gallium arsenide technology. Now, the, the timeline for this is five, ten years down the line. Um, they have some initial milestones, deployments, uh, earlier in the line, okay, of something like 154 megawatts uh, using an HCPV plant. I, I won't go into that. Uh, that should be online in a couple of hours. So in concentrating PV, we are starting to see uh, at least modest investments in this technology, much more so than we've ever seen in the last 10, 15 years. So there are glimmers of hope. We're starting to see investment capital come into the market. Part of this has been due to the European feed and trade, uh, the European feed in tariffs that have helped stimulate the flat plate silicon uh, market. Um, and probably just as important, the investors out there are starting to have some awareness of the market potential for not only solar, solar cells in general, but for concentrating PV specifically. That's also accompanied by um, growing interest in other renewable technologies, wind, solar, thermal. And um, I'd like to end with hybrid vehicles um, because I think hybrid vehicles are really a good model for how this industry could have grown, will have to grow in the next 10 years. I mean, hybrid vehicles get about two times the fuel economy of an average car. Our solar, cell, our solar cell that we've developed over the last 20 years is two to four times more efficient than, than the typical solar cell that we have out there. By saving fuel, um, uh, we reduce the, the number of tons of CO2 uh, dumped into the atmosphere by this uh, car to something on the order of three tons per year per car. We began development of our solar cell in the mid-80s, as, as was done for the hybrid cars. Uh, production stand, uh, started at about the same time. Uh, Spectralab started making those solar cells in the mid-90s. Uh, Honda and 
Toyota started making their, their, their hybrid vehicles. I'd like to say that we had invested a billion dollars, okay, in the development of our solar cell, <laughs> but I think it's more like a tenth of that at most. Um, so we've actually done a pretty good job with uh, about one-tenth the money. Um, one of the big um, arguments against concentrator, concentrating PV is that, is that because of these moving parts and you know so forth and so on, they're going to be very complicated and not going to be very reliable. Um, when the hybrid cars came out, there were numerous problems with, li with reliability, and yet in 2006, last year, the Prius is considered one of the most reliable cars on the road. Also, the initial public acceptance of the hybrid was fairly low because it was considered too expensive, and yet last year, over 500,000 hybrid cars were sold worldwide. Well, what if, in that same time period, we had had a similar rate of growth with these concentrating PV dishes? So in other words, if we had produced 500,000 of these dish concentrating PV systems. Remember what I said, last year we made three megawatts of concentrating P, enough megawatts to supply maybe 1,000 homes. With 500,000 would have been more like three million homes. Another interesting piece of data, last year the car industry worldwide produced 65 million cars, okay? If that had been 65 million dish systems, we'd be well over two terawatts today, okay? So these things are doable. Um, these concentrators, they're not the, they're not super high tech. I mean, and the part that is high tech is very small and it's very manageable and it's very efficient. I'd like to leave, before I go to my summary, um, show you a, a graph, a pie chart from the most recent World Energy Outlook, 2006, published by the International Energy Agency. And what this shows is the accumulated investment in energy infrastructure. Um, I don't know exactly what their reference scenario is, but it doesn't include very much solar. <laughs> from 2005 to 200, uh, 2030. Let me first of all draw your attention to this. The total investment is on the order of $20 trillion. Okay. Half of that, um, more than half of that is going into electricity, power generation and transmission. There is a bit of a renewable uh, aspect to this. 1% is going into biofuels don't quite know why, because it doesn't make an awful lot of sense from the renewable standpoint, but maybe that's why it's in there. But my point is, is that the industry, the conventional power industry out there, is already planning to invest $20 trillion over the next 20 some odd years. I think with, with green friendly government policy, we should be able to get a part of that, either through carbon tax, incentives, that sort of thing. So finally, um, in the next 20 years or so, we're going to need terawatts of carbon-free power. Looks like that hyphen got misplaced. The gallium arsenide gallium phosphide concentrator PV technology is probably one of the most promising ways of getting uh, to that level of green-free power. It's going to require a tremendous amount of capital investment, and I believe it's going to require changes in government policy more friendly to, uh, to green energy. Um, it's also going to take a lot of awareness on the part of the public. You know, if, P if the public didn't know about the Prius or the, Hi or the uh, Honda hybrids, they're not going to buy them. And when they do buy them, they don't buy them because they cost less, <laughs> okay? They, they buy them because the information about where this world is going in terms of climate change, uh, the energy situation, they buy them in an effort to try and do their part uh, to mitigate the problems associated with those. 
issues. So what we're doing here today is, is you know, in some ways I call it, you know, preaching to the choir. We need to go out and we need to talk to other people. We need to tell them, you know, what you've heard today. Um, spread the word. Let people know that there's a problem out there. There are solutions. And I think um, with time, the general population and uh, the world's governments are going to come around and we're going to get this problem under control. Thank you. Otherwise, we shall uh, defer all questions to the uh, end of the symposium. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, my colleague from the Faculty of Engineering, uh, Professor Avi Kyrgios. Subject. Well, I will talk about the solar electricity research in Israel. Glorious uh, past and uh, Glorious, more glorious uh, future? Is it? Or promising one? No, don't exaggerate. <laughs> well, we, we have heard about this uh, enormous breakthrough and uh, re emergence of concentrating photovoltaics. And today there are dozens of, many dozens of companies worldwide who are trying to push this technology and find practical applications for it. Uh, also, many research institutes and also many governments are supporting this effort. This is an enormous effort worldwide. There's also an even bigger effort to further develop the silicon solar cell technology, also by hundreds of companies and many governments worldwide. And there's also another parallel effort for solar thermal technology, which I'll mention a little bit later, uh, which means generating electricity from solar energy without photovoltaic cells, but by using high temperature heat and machines like those in standard uh, conventional power stations. So there is an enormous effort to, to bring solar energy uh, to this vision of, of terawatts. Uh, the big players in this uh, big effort is um, the large countries like the United States, like Germany, Japan, China, and so on. And the question is, what can tiny Israel contribute to this effort? Can we really make an impact? Can we do something? And based on the title that you see, my opinion is yes, we have already made a significant contribution, and we can make even more in the future. So just a very short uh, historical review. What have we done that really means something in this field of solar energy? Probably the first big achievement is in the field of solar collectors for water heating. This is not yet electricity production, but solar water heating is also important. And it started back in the 1950s. Solar water heaters were not invented in Israel. They were around, but they were very inefficient, not very popular. And back in the 1950s, an Israeli scientist invented something called selective coating. This is just a thin layer of coating over the surface of the solar collector that better absorbs the solar radiation and loses less energy back to the environment. And this little improvement raised the efficiency of these solar collectors from something like 30-40% to 60% or even more. So this led to a breakthrough in Israel and worldwide in acceptance of solar water heaters. So this was probably the first major uh, contribution that we made. And now solar water heaters are very popular in many countries. This is also growing at a very fast rate of, of more than 20% per year, very big industry. And it all started back in the 1950s with this little invention in Israel who made it all cost-effective, efficient, and, uh, and a good idea to, to use. Uh, later, this selective coating, the idea of selective coating was used also in solar power plants, and I'll get to that in a minute. The next big contribution that would seem a little strange is solar ponds. But solar ponds is, is a kind of exotic idea that never took off, never worked. And why is that? Solar ponds were very popular in the 60s, a nice idea how to collect solar energy and store it with a very little investment, just a big hole in the ground with some water in it. 
So it was very uh, attractive idea at the time, but it turns out the efficiency is very low, so it doesn't make sense and nobody's using it anymore. But in this project of solar ponds, there was a need to develop a machine that would convert the heat to electricity, a machine that would operate at low temperature, not at 400, 500 degrees centigrade, but around 100 degrees. And after the solar pond idea died, the same technology, the same kind of machine, the low temperature turbine was used or converted for using geothermal plants. And an Israeli company called Ormat took this technology and now it is the worldwide leader in geothermal power plants. So this project to start, that started in solar energy and then moved to geothermal, another form of renewable energy, is probably the second big contribution that we made with a significant impact worldwide. And the third one, whoops. the third one, which may be the most well-known, is the parabolic trough technology with uh, solar power plants uh, still operating today in California, the size of 350 megawatts, and they were built by an Israeli company called Luz. And uh, this technology, one of the most important ingredients is again the selective coating, which is used to achieve very high conversion efficiency when the plant is operating at high temperatures around 400 degrees. So this Israeli company was a pioneer and it built uh, these plants in, uh, during the 1980s. Most of these plants are still operating today and at even higher efficiency than it, than it was in the beginning. And actually these power plants are used as a reference whenever somebody comes and says, I will have a, I suggest a, a new solar technology then everybody says, okay, how does this compare to the loose plants in California? So this is a major uh, a success story of an Israeli company, and this is probably our third big contribution that we made already to, to the world of solar energy. So this is history. What do we have today? And I'm talking about the uh, research and development, because unfortunately in Israel we don't have significant implementation we don't have big solar power plants in Israel, not yet anyway. So let's talk about research and development. So we have many research institutes, academic research institutes. Here is a representative list that's not all of them, but those that have significant research. And also we have many companies, some of them large and uh, established, some of them startup companies trying to make the first steps. They are spread all over the country, and I think that for a small country like Israel, this is already a, a very large proportion or, or a critical mass that can really take us forward. What are they all doing in solar energy? It turns out that it's very diverse, and in a short time I cannot really do justice to each and every topic that is being developed in Israel, so what I'll do is just give a sample or a brief survey or the highlights of what some people do in Israel. And just remember, this is not everything. So probably the first that has to be mentioned is a continuation of this work on parabolic trough. The first, the original company, Luz, went bankrupt in the beginning of the 90s because of some financing problems, not because the technology was not good. But the same technology continues to be developed by another company in Israel, called Solel, and this company is offering solar power plants based on the same principles, the same kind of technology, but of course they continue to improve the technology, and a solar power plant that they would build today would be much better, much more efficient, and much more cost effective than what Luz built 25 years ago. Uh, recently this company has received several contracts to build or to, to participate in building of solar power plants in Spain and in the United States, and hopefully there will be also at least one or two in Israel. So the development work that they do to improve the performance of this uh, technology is mostly concentrated on the critical element here, the pipe that absorbs the solar radiation. This is the reflector that collects light from a large aperture area, and all the light goes on this tube. And this tube is a very sophisticated device. It's not a simple tube. It has this selective coating that we can see here on the inner tube. It has an external glass tube and a vacuum in between the two. The role of the glass tube and the vacuum is to reduce the losses of energy from the hot tube 
uh, to the environment. This glass is also coated to uh, minimize the reflection of sunlight that would be lost from the process. There are many technological issues of how to hold the glass and the metal together, how to deal with thermal expansion. It's a whole lot of sophisticated solutions. And this is really the core technology. This is what Solel is selling to everybody else, and nobody else can uh, come close to the performance of the Solel technology in the conversion of sunlight to heat in these plants. Another approach to solar thermal technology, again, not photovoltaic cells, but based on heat that is then converted to electricity using some machine, some turbine. Another approach is to use higher concentration, higher temperature, in order to power a higher temperature turbine, which has a higher efficiency. In order to do that, we need a solar tower, like the, this is the one that we have at Weizmann, Weizmann Institute. We place our machinery on the tower, and we have a large field of reflector. Each one is aimed to reflect solar radiation to this uh, target. What we would like to do with this concentrated radiation is schematically shown here. The radiation <laughs> goes to something called the solar receiver that converts it to thermal energy at high temperature. And this thermal energy goes into a gas turbine. Gas turbine is something like an aircraft engine that uh, is rotated by air at high pressure and high temperature. Of course, in the aircraft engine, we use fuel. We burn the fuel in order to create this high temperature. Here, we use solar energy instead. And it turns out that from the gas turbine, we can take the exhaust stream, and it still have, has enough energy to power a steam turbine and to generate some additional electricity. And both of these together are called a, a combined cycle. And using this combined cycle, the conversion efficiency from heat to electricity can be 60% or a little more. So this is actually the most efficient uh, machinery to convert heat to electricity that exists today. And if we can use solar energy to power this very efficient ma machinery, of course, the overall efficiency of the solar conversion would be very high. The challenge in this technology is here, the solar receiver, something that is subject to a very high flux of energy, of radiation energy, has to operate at high pressure, at high temperature. And here in Israel, at Weizmann Institute, we invested, I think, over a decade of development work in order to solve this problem. And this is an example of the receiver that we built. We had to solve many problems related to strength of materials at high temperature, to complicated flow patterns that occur inside the receiver, to problems of heat transfer, and so on. And we have achieved what we set out to do. We demonstrated operation at 1,200 degrees centigrade, which is suitable for operation of probably uh, almost all the gas turbines that are available. They are operating in this uh, range of temperature, also at high pressure. So this technology can work. Uh, other aspects of this the same technology is the optics. If we have this big <coughs> solar power plant with big machinery, we would like to put all the machinery on the ground to simplify the tower. So we developed an optical solution with a large mirror on top of the tower that redirects all the energy so we can put everything at the ground level. And this is not only on paper, but actually a demonstration was built with a section of this large mirror on the tower, a big solar receiver. So we really have taken this technology from idea to some steps of development, and the principles are proven. Now, how many power plants based on this technology were built? Up to now, zero, unfortunately. And that is because to build a large power plant with this large field and the turbines, the initial investment is very high. It could be something like $100 million just to demonstrate the first prototype or pilot plant. And until now, we were not able to, to raise this kind of money. But I think the technology will work, and it's a question of reducing the risk and getting some more confidence from the people who do have the money. In parallel to this, we also developed a similar technology, but not for large power plants, but for small power plants, not multi-megawatt, but maybe 100, 200 kilowatts. And this is what it would look like with a small number of these mirrors and the small turbine on the tower. And this is what the turbine looks like, this box. 
and here's the solar receiver connected and integrated into the turbine. Uh, demonstration system operating on these principles was built by a company called Adig, it was built in China, and it is working, and they hope to build many more of these. Hopefully they will succeed. So this was about solar thermal technology, converting solar energy to electricity by an intermediate steps of thermal energy and then a machine. But let's go back to the photovoltaic technology, the concentrating photovoltaics that we heard about. Uh, we in Israel do not develop these or, or build these advanced cells. Apparently we do not have the infrastructure or the capability to work at, at, at this front. But we do many other things that are related to the concentrating photovoltaic technology. And we concentrate on things that are a little easier to do, like the optics of the concentrators, like the system integration, like the module integration, which means how to take these cells and connect them together to something that works. So one example of one project that is going on at Sdeboker in the Negev uh, desert is using this large parabolic dish. This is actually the largest in the world, as far as I know, the largest one that is moving to, to track the sun, more than 400 square meters. And in the focal area of this dish, we put this kind uh, of photovoltaic module. This is not the advanced cells that were developed at NREL, but a different type of cells that were developed in Germany and also promises to, to, be, to give the high efficiency. So this is one type of system that is being developed, intended for large power plants. Each one of these can generate maybe 100 kilowatts of electricity, and if you have a large desert area, you can put many of these to create a large power plant. On the other end, this was the biggest dish. So here is maybe not the smallest dish, but a very small dish that was developed in a different, with, with a different kind of end use in mind. This dish that we see here is about one meter in size. The cells are placed here. This is a picture of only six cells, so this is about this size, a few centimeters. And the idea is not to build large power plants, but to distribute these systems on rooftops everywhere. There is a huge amount of uh, empty rooftops that are not used for anything. The area is free, so why not put these systems on these rooftops very close to the consumer? And this is called distributed generation. So this is another type of system that we develop here in Israel. And these cells are actually made by Spectrolab in the U.S. using the same technology that was developed in NREL that we heard about earlier. Another concept which is very similar but is designed to integrate into the building, not just sit on top of the roof, but integrate into the building so it would look like this, like any flat collector for water heating or flat plate TV. But since it is concentrating, it has to move to follow the sun, so we put all the tracking, all the motion, everything inside, and everything is covered by a glass plate. So it is operating according to the same principles, generates electricity using these high-performance cells, but everything is hidden inside, so it gives better integration into the building structure. Another principle that we develop here, and uh, actually it's very simple, but I think not many people in the world thought to go in this direction, is the principle of cogeneration or polygeneration. Even if we take these high efficiency cells, uh, we realize that something like 70% of the solar radiation that we collected is being lost. And we get maybe 20 or 30% of it as electricity. So why should we lose all this energy since we worked hard to, to collect it? So let's try to capture this energy. This energy is available as heat. And let's try to use this heat as an additional energy product coming out from the same system. So now we have cogeneration, which means the same system produces one stream of electricity and one stream of heat, two different products that both can be used by the end user. And then from the solar uh, energy that we collected, we actually use maybe 70% or even slightly more and not only 20%. So this makes a lot of sense. Um, and this is also very easy to do because in a photovoltaic, in a concentrating photovoltaic system, you always have to take care of this heat and remove it. So in the back of the cell, there is always some kind of metal plate or something similar that removes the heat and discharges it 
to the environment. So instead of throwing away the heat, we circulate some kind of liquid in this metal plate. Could be water or another liquid, it doesn't matter. And this liquid goes to the user, and the user can use the heat instead of just throwing it to the environment. One of the most interesting, in my opinion, uh, applications for this approach is to use the heat for air conditioning. Obviously, whenever you have high solar radiation, you also have the need for cooling and air conditioning. So it goes together very well. So we can use the heat coming from the PV cell to power a machine called <coughs> absorption heat pump or absorption chiller. It doesn't matter what goes on inside. This is existing technology. This machine accepts heat, and at the other end, it gives cooling. It doesn't matter how it does it. So we just connect an absorption heat pump, and we get the cooling energy as an additional energy product, and we save additional electricity by not having to operate a conventional air conditioner that consumes electricity. So if we count how much electricity overall we save by producing electricity and saving on the air conditioner, we can get these fantastic numbers of 40 to 45 percent. This is based on thermodynamic analysis. And let's remember that the standard photovoltaic cells have about 15% efficiency. The advanced systems based on the multi-junction cells, but producing electricity only, would have about 30% efficiency. And here we can go above 40% efficiency just by using this little trick of capturing the thermal energy. In a different direction, probably some of you have heard about this American company, Sol Focus, that raised a lot of interest and raised a lot of money subsequently. Uh, and they are develop developing this kind of uh, very elegant system that is built of many small concentrators. Each one is built from three stages of concentration, a primary reflector, a secondary reflector, and the terminal third stage. And here is a small photovoltaic cell. Um, even those who heard about this company probably don't know that the uh, original design and the optimization that led to this is a, was actually done at Ben Gurion University here by Israeli researchers. So um, th I think this is a, a, a very elegant and very nice design that really answers all the requirements that we can place on a concentrating photovoltaic system because it provides very high concentration, could be a thousand or even more easily. It uh, provides a very nice way for cooling that has no obstruction for the incoming radiation because it comes from the other side. Uh, it is relatively easy to produce. Of course, it has to be produced with sufficient accuracy and so on, but it is not so difficult. And it is very compact. Usually, concentrators have a long focal length, so they put the cell over here. But here, everything was designed and optimized to be very compact, and this is very good for installation, for transportation, so this is a very nice design, and I'm happily taking credit for this by work of my colleagues from Ben Gurion University. The same research group is actually looking forward to, to the next stage. We are talking about concentration of 1,000. This is where everybody else is. Uh, but they are asking the question, what happens if we can increase the concentration, let's say, to 10,000? The, the, there are no, let's say, commercial large-scale concentrators who can do this today. But let's say that there will be someday. Will, be, will we be able to operate our photovoltaic cells uh, at this range of 10,000 concentration? Uh, will the efficiency be higher? Will there be a, any problem? So they actually have a concentration of 10,000 coming out from this optical fiber going into the photovoltaic cells, and they make very nice basic investigations of what happens in this range of concentration. And this is something that may be implemented in 10 or 20 years. And it's very nice to investigate now whether it's a good idea to go in this direction. Just a few tidbits of other projects. Uh, this is a project in the US with a very unique design of passive cooling for the photovoltaic cell. And this was actually developed by an Israeli researcher at Weizmann Institute, just to mention contributions. This is another project with a very nice idea of spectral splitting of the radiation and then going to two separate cells. And again, an Israeli inventor, entrepreneur, is involved in this project, although the project itself is carried in the United States. And there are many other things that I have no time to mention, many other investigations 
in Israel on basic aspects of, of materials and how the electrons go from one place to another inside the photovoltaic cell, and also practical uh, questions of uh, production, manufacturing, lowering, uh, reducing the cost, and so on. So we have no time, but I have to leave you with the impression that there is much more than wh what I described here. Um, so what can we see for the future? What will be our contribution? I think looking at the current research, we realize that Israeli researchers are contributing in many aspects, maybe not in development or manufacturing of the cells, but in just about everything else. And uh, our researchers are uh, contributing to many projects, both in Israel and in other countries. So I think this is the way to go, because the energy problem is really a global question, and we have to work with others and combine ideas and resources. So what I've tried to show you is that we do have a, a diverse and an active research community here that, can, that has reached a lot of achievements and can reach even more. Uh, what we don't have yet is implementation, but this is changing, at least I hope so. We have a lot of interest from the business community, from many investment funds in Israel are now going green. And that doesn't mean that they're actually investing money. Probably the amount of money invested is not so high yet, but at least everybody's talking green, so this is the first step. And probably most important is the government. Uh, for many years in Israel, the government has done practically nothing to support solar energy, only very little drops of support. But during the last year, we are hearing more and more that the government wants to do something. The government realizes that this is important, and we have a resource in Israel, in the research community, that it would be a shame not to use and not to develop. So this is probably the biggest uh, factor that would influence the future of solar energy in Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers. Uh, uh, I'd like to open the floor for discussions, questions to the speakers are still here. Uh, any question? Yes, uh, Ruben, please. I have a question to the first speaker. Uh, I'm one of the confused. And uh, I know that the, the Earth has been warming up for more than the last hundred years, at least since the last mini ice age of uh, five, six hundred years ago. How do we separate the contribution of whatever natural processes are occurring to those that are man-made. How do we know that it's us that's doing it rather than what's been going on since uh, 1600, 1400, whenever it was that the last many ice age was? Well, the, the one, one good way to do that is to measure the different contributions. And since the 1970s, we've been able to measure the solar irradiance which is a <clears throat> has always been a major consideration and probably was the predominant factor in the Little Ice Age. Um, we know that the sunspots disappeared during that period, and we can't convert the knowledge of... That, that was during the early... The first telescopes were available then, and, and Galileo observed the sunspots, and... Uh, but uh, but we can't go backward uh, to get precise measurements at that time, but we can attempt to relate uh, visible features and using our knowledge of solar physics. But at any rate, uh, now we can measure, and the sun is varying by a tenth of a percent with on the 11-year solar cycle. But there's no, so far there's no trend. And um, there are other natural factors that we can measure. The volcanoes uh, provide a significant um, forcing occasionally. Um, the thing is that if we compare that with the forcing due to human-made greenhouse gases, the humans uh, are now winning. Uh, and that's why I believe that now the last 30 years the temperature has just started monotonically 
uh, almost uh, in increasing. Um, and we can we can look, although it's it's a little difficult to look back over this last uh, millennia, uh, that because the climate change has been on a global average very small. There's been a slight cooling over the last uh, six or eight thousand years, and that's um, again it's probably related to the changes in the geographical distribution of sunlight due to the changes in the Earth's orbit. Um, but um, anyway, it's it's uh, uh, the, the evidence is is clear enough that humans have become the dominant factor, even though on the longer time scales, of course, the natural forcings and was were the major factor. Yeah, that that's a good question. That's that's what something needs to be done relatively rapidly to reduce that gap in um, under scientific understanding and the um, public knowledge. Um, there is, you know, in the last year or two, there has been quite a bit done. Um, Al Gore's movie has been partially successful, although that. The difficulty it, it does become political in, to some degree, and so some people are just not willing uh, to accept that. Even though I think he made a, a pretty good attempt to make sure his science he was discussing was was basically correct. Um, I don't know. Uh, that that's the thing that we've been struggling with. Uh, how do we get? Um, because there's there is this fundamental difficulty that until you see the effects, it's there are just so many other things that people have to be concerned about. Certainly in Israel, that's true. Uh, that you're not going to worry about theoretical problems uh, until they really are obvious and. For the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the inertia of the system, the long, long life of the gases that were put in the atmosphere, it's a, it's a difficult problem. When we're just at the, at this point where we're crossing into the time period, we're entering the period when you can see the effects. We we see that the Arctic sea ice is melting. We see that the ice sheets are beginning to disintegrate. And uh, we have only a limited period to uh, to do something about that. So my answer is I can't. I don't really have a good uh, answer. I you know I'm trying to do that, uh, but it's um, it's not easy. Um, and uh, so I'm <laughs> I'm open to any suggestions. Thank you very much. I must say we must conclude now. So I'd like to uh, close with a uh, very, very interesting uh, symposium. I'd like to thank the organizers.